You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And as you can see, I'm not in my studio. I'm actually on location again. I'm up in Annapolis, Maryland at the headquarters of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Last time I was here, I was talking to Joe Love. And today I'm here with Ryan. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. He is now the new head of the title Black Bass Manager. Um, You just started this role and I really appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to come join me. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate uh, being able to talk to you. How, I mean, uh, I mean, a little background, like how did you get into this profession? Um, I think, and I've, I've listened to the podcast before, but I think I've heard you talk to a lot of other biologists and this question kind of comes up a lot because it's such a niche field. Um, and some of the, some of the answers that most biologists give, and I've heard them on other podcasts too, kind of talking about this field is that They just loved fishing. They grew up fishing and they kind of wanted to see, you know, outside of professional fishing, there's not really any direction you can go to make that your livelihood. And so they kind of sought out some source and they figured out about being a biologist Um, or another kind of similar role that people take is that they just love being outside and they go to school for biology and they meet uh, a teacher or a professor that says, hey, we, you know, you can do this for a living. You can be a wildlife biologist. You can be a fisheries biologist. Um, I think I'm kind of uh, one of the one of the more smaller kind of introductions to it in that it was kind of a family thing for me. Uh, my dad is uh, ha- has been a biologist. He worked or is a biologist. Um, and so he worked in the field and I can remember as being five, 10 years old and playing hooky from middle school and going out and stocking fish with him or going out and tagging fish or that kind of stuff. So I was introduced to it, uh, by my dad, kind of what his profession is. Um, and then I just kind of decided, you know, this is, this is something that's a lot of fun. I love to be outside and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I kind of took that direction when I decided to go to college. That's pretty cool. That's that's a really cool dad. And and you know, just for people at home that don't know, who who is your dad and where did you grow up specifically? Uh so I grew up uh, just outside of Baltimore. Uh, my dad's Marty Gary. Um and he worked for Maryland DNR for 28 years and then he worked at Potomac Potomac River Fisheries Commission for 10 years and now he's at a uh, New York Division of uh, Marine Fisheries. Mm-hmm. When your family does a profession, let's say they are, they're in construction, there's that weird tendency as a kid to go one of two ways to double down on sort of like the family business or like, I'm going to go the exact opposite direction. Did you have that moment at all of like, is this something I really want to do? Or was it just always your lifelong, like, yep, hundred percent lockstep. This is what it's always been. Uh, I always wanted to do something in fishing or in the outdoors. And I can remember, you know, saying to my dad, oh, I'm going to be a professional fisherman or I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that. And then you kind of like, once you get to high school, you're like, yeah, that might not be, might not be the exact thing you can do. So it was never really a question. It was like when I was applying to colleges, it was like, who has the best fisheries uh, degree that lines up with my interests and where I want to be. So it it was, it wasn't really anything I ever second guessed. Who has like, that's an interesting question. I mean, we all know about medical or veterinary, uh, different schools that have really good programs there. But never fisheries biology is like, I guess it's just because I haven't investigated. What are a couple, including the one that you ended up going to that are in the country? Yeah. So it kind of depends on what exactly you want to do. If you want to focus on marine fisheries or things like that, you can look at uh, University of Washington or uh, Univer- or Oregon State has really good really? marine hmm. programs. Um, if you want to look at freshwater fisheries, um, some really good ones are Auburn. Um, Tennessee Tech is a good program. Um, kind of the more Southeast, uh, is pretty good for freshwater. Um, and then you also have to look at kind of what you want to do. There's main professors and we're kind of getting to the weeds of this, but there's professors, uh, who do research, um, and also teach. And then there's another program, um, that's basically called the cooperative lab. They're USGS partners with a state run, uh, university. And so they'll do specific funding with um for the state so the state will provide them funding and pretty much those professors 
the idea is that all they do is research and they bring on master students um, okay. to partner for certain projects. So they're more dedicated to uh, state-led research and what meets their management needs or their conservation needs, whereas professors kind of do more ecological approaches sometimes. And that's not always the case. Uh, professors can do some more management-related research, but, <clears throat> but it kind of depends. Uh, but I ended up going to uh, LSU, Louisiana State University. Um, that's just kind of where my interests were. Uh, I visited a couple different schools, but uh, ended up being really the best fit for me. Uh, I had a really good professor that I got along with very well down there, Mike Caller, uh, and he kind of convinced me that that was the right place, and it was a very good decision and, uh, from my perspective looking back. What kind of field work down at LSU in Louisiana, um, I, I, I had... Lord, I'm going to forget his name. He helped run the smallmouth actually stocking program for Maryland, but he talked about they did stuff for uh, paddle paddlefish, um, and that was a, a use case that they did a lot in the field. Is there certain things that you did out in the field there that really stick out to you at LSU? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, LSU is just or Louisiana in general is just so diverse. Oh, I mean, man. you have North Louisiana, which is a lot of fresh water, Mississippi River coming in there, the Red River, and then you talk about the coast, which is just a whole nother ball game. Um, and so we, LSU had a really good program where it was balanced between freshwater uh, and the coastal environment. So you really got a good diversity uh, of experiences. You would go out and work on some of their bigger lakes, some of their rivers, you know, the Mississippi where you're getting experience with big river fish like paddlefish and gulf sturgeon and the Pearl hmm. River, um, things like that. But you also go down to the, uh, to the coast and you're working with redfish and speckled trout. So um, that's one of the things that I really liked about it is they really made a point with our field work of getting you a diverse amount of um, experiences, you know, so you could figure out what you liked and where you kind of wanted your the trajectory of your career to go. And so from LSU, did you hop from there to your first deployment, so to speak, in, in Arkansas, I believe, or did you get more schooling in between those two? I've stops? got a, a wealth of experience in between the two. Okay. Um, I kind of decided after LSU, um, the cool thing about fisheries is that there's so many really cool seasonal field jobs when you're coming mm -hmm. out of undergrad. Um, and these are just essentially anywhere from three to a year plus terms, um, short term positions where you can be contracted for field work. Um, and it's a lot of people go from undergrad straight to grad school. But I really wanted I was kind of sick of school at that time. I wanted to go out in the field. I wanted to work. And so I kind of decided I wanted to go out west. So I applied to. Uh, a bunch of different of those seasonal uh, technician positions. Oh, cool. Um, and so I basically looked at Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and Oregon. And I applied to a ton of positions, and I got really fortunate um, that I got hooked up in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Hmm. Um, and I worked there for almost a year. Coeur d'Alene's up in the panhandle, um, so it's about three hours from British Columbia. Um, and so I spent almost a year working up there with that uh with idaho fish and game and we did a lot of really cool work the panhandle's super diverse you have these really big lakes uh like lake Coeur d'Alene, which has a pretty decent bass fishery up there um, it's hosted some tournaments um, and then you've got other big lakes like lake pendere you've also got big rivers um, and then you've got your more traditional western trout uh, trout streams so i was working on any anything from pipe uh, or pike to uh West Slope cutthroat trout um, to species eradication, um, like lake trout, which are invasive and are out competing hmm. bull trout. I didn't know that. Um, so I was working on in so many diverse species out there. Uh, it was just really cool because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go out west, see the mountains, work with a lot of different fish. Uh, and it was really the perfect opportunity for me, um, for me there. And then after Idaho, um, I wanted to be a little bit more closer to home. So I got a position with North Carolina Marine Fisheries and I worked with the striped bass program there and the Alosin project there. So I was working with striped bass and also river herring uh, out of Elizabeth City, North Carolina. So Maryland boy to Louisiana to the Canadian woodshed up there in Ohio <laughs> and then all the way to Carolina. That is a hell of a... You and we got two more traveled. stops left. Goodness gracious, man. Yeah. So after I finished up a year, I was in Elizabeth City and had a great time there. Um, really learned about long-term monitoring because that striped bass project is a long-term yep. monitoring in the Albemarle Sound. Um, and so is the Alosin project working with blueback and alewife um, herring. Um, but I 
wanted to be a biologist. That's, you know, that was the goal of my career. Uh, and so I knew I had to go back to school. Um, so at that time in, uh, in North Carolina, I was applying for graduate positions. And I got really fortunate um, that I had some experience with side scan sonar doing mapping hmm. uh, when I worked with uh, NOAA Chesapeake Bay office in high school. Um, and so I kind of leveraged that, uh, that experience using side scan sonar um, to get a position with Oklahoma State, uh, where I essentially was looking at paddlefish spawning habitat um, throughout uh, the entire state of Oklahoma. I mapped uh, 150 kilometers of nine different rivers in Oklahoma. Damn. Um, and basically what we were looking at for my graduate research was um, paddlefish, and we're kind of covering a lot of information here, but paddlefish are uh, similar to sturgeon in that they need hard substrates to spawn on successfully. Um, and they had been eradicated from a lot of their range in Oklahoma, and they had been reintroduced in part of that. And one aspect of my research there was to look and see if the amount of that hard substrate in those rivers uh, was allowing them to become sex successfully uh, naturally reproducing, um, or did they fail in those uh, attempts to reintroduce them? <clears throat> reintroduce them. It's interesting because we always hear the the negative connotation in the echo chamber of technology and fishing when it comes to forward facing sonar, side scan, things like that. And it's been something I've been always curious about is how it can be actually integrated into research. Um, and when you mentioned uh, you know side scan. At the time, how radically different was that technology? When you said like you could almost, it sounds like sort of speak, pioneer, like, hey, we can use this to help with our data. That's very interesting. Yeah, so it's it's still, we're kind of, the, the forefront of that was probably in 2010, 2011. There was a paper put out by Kaiser and Litz where they were really the first ones to use side scan sonar and they used it in some Georgia rivers uh, to look at habitat different boulder, cobble, sand substrates. And they were really the first ones that said, hey, we can use side scan sonar and we can collect images and then we can classify substrates and habitats from those, uh, those images and we can use this as a scientific method. Um, so by the time I started school, which I started grad school in 2019, um, there were a couple other papers out there. So it's still relatively new, but it was it was proven that you could do that. And now it's only even getting better and better. I mean, mm -hmm. we know live scope is kind of new on the scene um, and side scan just keeps getting better and better with new uh, with each new iteration. So um, that's something that we're actually going to be probably looking into using in the Tidal Bass program um, in the next couple of years. It is interesting with forward facing sonar. Um, I, I I had an episode drop with the, the individual that actually runs Lake Fork with the Texas department because he put a paper out on the effects of forward facing sonar. But an interesting thing that we kind of spun off that conversation was using it as an observation tool in the wild because you can use you can use cameras and stuff for anything that's up above the surface of the water to see what they're like. Forward facing sonar gives you the ability to actually see how they interact. And he said, like, you're learning new things about their behavior. And do you think in like 10 years, like as this thing gets better and better and you can just hit record, that will be used more and more? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They already use a similar technology to that to count fish at passageways. Hmm. Um, you can see the fish go by uh, and based off of there's some some pretty new AI tools that can classify what that fish is depending on the shape in the sonar that's correct and the, so they can be like hey this is so and so species passing through here and they can tally that up um, and they've used it with a lot of a lot of different things so it's definitely in the fisheries management world in the fisheries science world you know we're using this just as much as the recreational anglers to help learn about our fisheries when you got um, to, to your post after you graduated you finished uh, your study on paddlefish, and you got really into the cold water species of the trout. What did you learn being up in the Montana, Idaho area? Cause like, I mean, examples, I didn't even know lake trout were invasive. What, what, like, what is their normal range? I guess it's, it's, is it the Canadian shed? I'd have to double check. I'm not sure on the entire range, but it's more great lakes. Got it. Um, okay. Like, and don't quote me on yeah. this cause I certainly don't know if I'm correct, but I do not think they're native on the other side of the, uh, the continental divide. Mm. Um, so I think it's a watershed thing like that. Um, but yeah, they're certainly not native out West and you can really look into it. Um, it's caused some serious problems, um, in Pendere, uh, particularly, and then also, uh, the Flathead Lake and, uh, over in Western Montana. And that's a really, really interesting case study, um, of just 
fisheries invasion and um, you know how different user groups value different things and uh, you can it even compounds you can get into uh, mysis shrimp which is really we're going down a rabbit hole here yeah, that's the fun part about this yeah but uh yeah there's an essentially in flathead lake and also in, in lake pendere up in north idaho um introduced uh introduced lake trout were doing fine they weren't really affecting other species like kokanee and bull trout um and essentially you had this great trophy fishery where you had a lot of large lake trout that weren't really affecting some of the other species but they introduced mysis shrimp which are very very small shrimp um, into the lake and that essentially changed the whole food web and flipped it where you now had an overpopulation of lake trout of smaller lake trout that were impacting them because of this new food source and you no longer really had a really good trophy fishery and then all those native fishes uh, like the kokanee and the bull trout um, and some of the west slope uh, cutthroats were really being affected by the smaller, being essentially outcompeted uh, by the smaller lake trout because they could more effectively forage on mysis shrimp. Do the other do the other trout and kokanee species not forage on that shrimp, or would they not adapt to that new food source? Now, this is where I'm probably losing a lot of my knowledge on the subject, yeah. but I think from my understanding is that the lake trout are just more. Uh, they're just more advantageous effective yeah in okay. consuming that and they overpopulated but i don't want to i don't want to talk i mean we can yeah, talk yeah, about yeah, more yeah. but i don't want to over speak on on that subject because i'm not super super certain on on the dynamics and it's a very complicated system that is that is fascinating that everyone and again everyone has their species that is invasive i had um i had an individual on who's a, a snakehead expert and he talked about when he went to japan and like over there like the large mouth is the invasive and it's yeah. just such a weird culture shock of the reverse of you they protect the snakehead the the bass is a public enemy number one and then to go out west and it's like okay it's, it's not anything we're dealing with here necessarily it's something unique but it, it shows you just like I guess the folly of man and that we just we move shit <laughs> we're yeah. not supposed to be moved yeah 100 percent. it's the same thing over here like i grew up catching brook trout out in western maryland and that's like the pinnacle of you know going to a small stream catching mm -hmm. a small fish you know whatever it's very pretty and scenic and native fish and then you go out west and the brook trout's invasive out west and you're like that's interesting <laughs> wow so very uh it's yeah we move stuff all over the place and people value different species differently what is the the prize catch out there. So when you said like the brook trout is, is not a nuisance almost out there, what is their prize possession? Uh, I think it really depends on who you're, who you're talking to. Um, I mean, for me, I really like uh, the bull trout out West. It's just this big, uh, this big trout that can get up to 30 inches plus in some, in some rivers. Uh, but it really depends on who you're talking to because you have the same thing here. You've got a lot of fly fishermen who like trout fishing in Maryland. And then you also got your bass fishermen. And, you know, it, it kind of depends. But trout weighs pretty heavily for me out west for sure. And then you got into switching context here. When you got your position out, um, I believe it's in Arkansas. You can correct me if I'm wrong. What what was your what were you overseeing? What was your job title there? Yeah. So once I graduated uh, from Oklahoma State with my master's, um, that's when pretty much most states nowadays, uh, you need a master's to be a biologist. So I <laughs> looked for my first biologist position. Um, and there was a couple ones that interested me. Um, I really wanted to be, you know, back on the East coast, a little bit closer to the family or maybe back down in South Louisiana. But I do love, I love trout and I love working with game fish and I love working with high profile fisheries. Um, and so a position opened up in mountain home, Arkansas, which is about a town, <laughs> of 12,000 people uh, up Lord. in north central Arkansas, uh, pretty much on the southern range of the Ozark Mountains. Um, and it was a trout biologist position working with the trout program. Um, and so I was a part of uh, a four person team. We had a technician, two biologists and a supervisory biologist. I was one of the biologists um, on that team. And we oversaw all of trout fishing in Arkansas um as as a team so three biologists and the technician and trout fishing for anyone who doesn't know in arkansas is a big business uh, i think the last economic impact report we did uh, was it was a little over i think it was close to 400 million direct economic expenditures mm. for just trout fishing we sell or arkansas sells about 130,000 trout permits a year um, so it brings millions of dollars just in revenue to arkansas game and fish um, it's pretty much one of the biggest fisheries out there besides maybe black bass fishing in Arkansas. 
Um, but that's what I really liked working with is not only trout, but a game fish, a game fish that people are invested in uh, and working with the anglers. Um, and that's something that really interested me coming back to Maryland for this position too, is, you know, black bass fishing in Maryland is uh, a big business. There's a lot of vested stakeholders. Um, it's a huge interest to people. And I like working not only with fish, um, but I believe, you know, one of my biggest skill sets is working with anglers. Um, I'm a recreational angler. I've I haven't fished as much this year with the move and everything, mm -hmm. but you know, on average, you know, I'm fishing a hundred plus days a year, um, which compared to some guys out there probably isn't that much. Um, but I feel like I can, uh, you know, associate and learn and really hear the anglers and communicate well with them. Um, and so, you know, working in these high profile fisheries like Arkansas trout fishing or black bass in Maryland, um, is something that, you know, I feel really passionate about. Um, so this was, a cool position for me to come from Arkansas and come back home, uh, you know, work for my state agency. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was a really cool position. I'm really fortunate uh, to be able to come back and work in Taws and work for, you know, the Maryland anglers. What is the differences, if you compare and contrast, the managing of trout versus black bass? Um, I mean, classic thing is there's way more tournament pressure on black bass than trout, but I, I believe one of the bigger threats to trout is just, you know, people illegally pulling too many out of the system. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of depends. Um, trout in general, definitely. Um, in Arkansas, a little bit differently. We don't have, we have a little bit of natural reproduction. Um, but the large majority of the fish in Arkansas are stocked fish. Hmm. Um, and so the main difference for me is that and it, there are some similarities between the two, uh, but the main differences in Arkansas is that I was really, uh, one of the things that was really hard for us as a program was managing competing interests. Mm. Um, you essentially had two main constituencies in Arkansas. Um, you had your fly fishermen who practice almost entirely catch and release, and you have some artificial lure fishermen that practice almost entirely catch and release as well. Um, so that's your one camp. Uh, and then you have another camp that's more harvest oriented, as we kind of say, they want to go out there, they want to catch their limit, uh, they want to take them home, and they want to eat them. Um, and so we would do multiple creel surveys, trout permit holder surveys, and those constituencies were pretty much split right down the middle. Um, you know, you had probably 30 or 40% bait fishermen harvest oriented, uh, 30 or 40% artificial lure, fly fishing only, uh, catch and release. And then you add, you know, a little bit of overlap between the two. And so they want two entirely different things, but you have to manage the resource for both of them. So that was probably one of the main, um, you know, challenges we had in Arkansas. Um, but you kind of have similar things going on here. You have your recreational um, anglers who love to practice catch and release. Um, but then you also have to deal with some of that tournament pressure um, who those guys are taking care of the fish and they're practicing catch and release. But, you know, you are going to have some tournament associated mortality and, you know, you are going to have some mortality associated with heavy fishing pressure that our, our rivers are receiving. So um, and there probably are some other uh, constituencies in Maryland. Um, and that's one of the things I'm still trying to do is just learn who's out there, who the people are, mm -hmm. what the problems are. Um, but there are some some differences, but a lot of similarities between the two. Um, Arkansas is, like I said, trout fishing super high profile, dealing with a lot of recreational anglers, different constituencies, and I, I see some of the, the same things here in uh, in Maryland working with black bass. How vocal are those constituencies in the trout fishing world? Because I, I know because I'm too close to it, the the bass echo chamber, for let's say, um, but I, I don't know as much about the trout world when it comes because you don't have. I mean, the one reason bass is so big is because the tournament scene is like a trillion dollar industry. It's so much money gets pumped into that. Yeah. Um, but then trout doesn't have usually tournament fishing. But I know the people that do pursue it, especially like the fly guys, that's those people got money too. And they are very, very vocal. So what what is that like when you had meetings and you had to reach out to these constituencies? Yeah, they have... You know, I'm still new to seeing, like I said, in in, uh, in Maryland. So yeah. I'm still learning about the voices and how large they are and how much they contribute. But they were probably just as large in Arkansas. Wow. Um, because you have, you know, like I said, I lived in Mountain Home, a town of 12,000 people. Um, 
and that town is on the North Fork and the White Rivers, and mm. you can look those up. But those are pretty yeah. uh, world-renowned fisheries, and uh, and without those two rivers and without the trout fishery there, you know, there's probably not nearly as many people. For the large majority, that town is pretty reliant, um, and the surrounding area is pretty reliant on revenue built up from trout fishing. Um, and so you have, you know, three or four big lodges on the river that are, you know, probably Gaston's is one of the biggest and it can probably house, I don't know how many cabins it has. It probably has 40 cabins on the river. And then, you know, just off the top of my head, I can, we probably have just over a hundred trout guides on the white river and, you know, fly fishing trip on white river runs you about. 550 to 650 a day Dang. so those guides wow. are making and you can fish year round so those hmm. guides are making you know a, a substantial living to where that's their full-time job and it's supporting you know plus or minus probably a hundred of them between the two rivers so those guys are very passionate about the fishery um and like i said they're on both both sides of the aisle you got your bait fishermen who want to harvest and your fly guides who want to uh see catch and release and bigger fish so they're very vocal they're very passionate about it and i can respect both sides of the coin because you know those guys are trying to make a living and they're you know they're guiding two different constituencies the guys who want to harvest and the guys who want to catch and release that's got to also be a unique challenge it, it, based on what you said earlier in the conversation where a lot of this i think it's like 90 percent ish you have to stock these rivers to maintain it because they don't have a, a natural breeding population. Logistically, that's got to be a nightmare. I mean, I'm mean, just thinking about the size of Arkansas versus Maryland and then the fact that like you have to do the lift as an agency there to keep these streams up. Was that something that you were involved in at all or just got to hear about? So we, uh, as a part of the trout management program, uh, the three biologists and the technicians, we kind of decided where and when to stock based off some of our data. Um, but we had a really, really great team, and I can't speak highly enough of them, um, for state hatcheries and the national federal hatcheries. And they raise, I think, close to 1.5 million fish a year. <laughs> wow, good Lord. Um, you know, the White River currently is receiving about three quarters of a million trout per year. Um, and that comes from Norfolk Hatchery, uh, and it comes from three main hatcheries, Norfolk uh, National Fish Hatchery, Greer's Ferry National Fish Hatchery, uh, and then the Arkansas-owned state hatchery, um, which is uh, Spring River. Um, and so those guys, you know, they work their tails off and they do a great job of keeping the fish in the river. Um, and I can't speak highly enough of them because they have, you know, oftentimes a thankless job. Um, but they do a great job and it is an absolute, you know, operation to keep those fish in the rivers. And it's a lot of people think, you know, you just, all right, well, we're going to raise these fish and stock them. Well, it's a 15 month process to get a rainbow trout mm -hmm. to stockable size and put in the river. So if you, if you miss any, you know, stops along the way, or you have any issues, it can affect your longevity, um, or your target or when you're trying to reach that. And so it can be a really complicated process. And so we worked pretty heavily with them, but they were in charge of essentially, you know, we said we would like this many fish to put in the river at this time. And it was their job to meet those, um, to meet those goals. And they did a great job of doing it and, and are doing a great job of doing that. And, and this is something that we've brought up before when I had Jason Halliker of Virginia on, they talked about their small mouth program. We went from like soup to nuts of like, like you said, like, it's not just, you just raise a fish and dump in the river. It's, you have to feed it. You have to, all the costs and stuff. And it's such a long haul for a year and money to get to release the fish. And I, I just, yeah, I've always been, no one understands outside of the people like you that actually work there, the logistical haul, the lift it is to go from the concept to raising, to putting that fish in the river. When you're dealing with, with not just the fish, but the environmental standpoints, was there anything like unique? Cause I know here in Maryland, it feels like we have, you know, we have invasive species like the snakehead and the blue cat. We have water issues. Like, I mean, so many things, but then of course we're next to Baltimore, DC, Philly. Like, I mean, did you have that in Arkansas, like water quality issues or invasives at all? Or is it, cause I'm thinking like Arkansas is just this pristine mountainous area. It looks that way. It's beautiful up there. Um, but yeah, we had, like every, any hatchery, they had their challenges. Um, and we also had invasives too. We had snakeheads uh, in Arkansas. Oh, shoot. Um, and those were actually 
uh, we actually we would collect them in the uh, the Little Red River, which is one of our tailwater trout fisheries. Hmm. So we had overlap there. Um, but yeah, they had a they had a lot of different uh, water quality issues. The Spring River hatchery is fed by a spring river so as constant cold water to raise those fish um, but because it's a river it would be subject to flooding if we got intense rainfall um, and that happened once in 2017 and pretty much wiped out a lot of the fishery or a lot of the hatchery and they lost a lot of fish um, that year um, and then we've also seen it occasionally since then, um, and that'll basically introduce a lot of warmer water or low dissolved oxygen water in the hatchery, which can kill off some fish or just set them back. So we've seen that a couple times. Um, and then also Spring River is, you know, having trouble with some of the uh, some diseases that they're trying to get rid of. And so the fish are raising fine, but they're still te- the water's still testing positive for IPN, hmm. which is a trout disease. Uh, and so that limits where we can stock. So that's one of the things they're dealing with. Um, and then if you want to talk about the federal hatcheries, they're way different. They are fed from the dam. So they're bringing that cool water mm. from the bottom of the lake into the hatchery <clears throat> to raise those fish. Um, and because of that, when the lakes turn over um, during sp- certain t- parts of the year, um, that can have issues with dissolved oxygen uh, in the hatchery, which can affect raising fish and where they have to draw water from to get the right temperature and the right dissolved oxygen. And then sometimes they're working with a little bit warmer temperatures than they want to. And that increases the, uh, bacteria and disease in the hatchery too. So there, I don't think there's any hatchery out there that doesn't have to think about water quality or disease or anything like that. That's fascinating. And just the fact that you went from managing Arkansas's pride and joy, you know, the, the White River system and all the lakes that that feeds to the tidal Potomac River, which, you know, it's funny. I had a, a conversation with my friend with this. Where I, I don't, Maryland had this thing fall in their lap, so to speak, where, you know, they have to take care of the Chesapeake Bay, the watershed there. But then all of a sudden over the past 10 years, the tidal Potomac became one of the number one largemouth bass places in the world. And that's. I mean, you have Gunnersville, you have the title Potomac, you like they, they all are synonymous in the same sentence. And that's fascinating. Like that's a responsibility in itself when you are on the front cover of so many magazines saying, come here. And then, you know, for people that, that aren't from Maryland, but Virginia, like look at the size of Maryland. Like it's not a big state like Texas and what they have resource wise. And that's, that's a hell of a responsibility, but it seems like you've already kind of dealt with that too. Like I uh, alluded to earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, and I had a lot of passionate stakeholders in Arkansas. And one of the, one of the things I'd tell them is I like working with passionate people. I don't, I don't shy away from that. Um, you know, you're going to have controversy managing these big fisheries. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to shy away from that. I like working with passionate people because it means they care. It means they have a vested interest in the fishery. Um, and so, you know, it is a challenge, no doubt. I don't want to understate that. Um, but it's something that I look forward to and something that makes the job interesting. And, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not boring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, no. I'll tell you that. No, 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 no. It is not boring. <laughs> uh, yeah. Dealing with people, the more people you add, the more, uh, exciting life can be. That's for that's sure. That's right. How much has this place changed though? You know, stepping back, not job wise, but growing up here, leaving and coming back. That's an interesting perspective because when you grow up in the same place and you never leave, I think subtle things don't stand out to you as much. But when you leave and come back, even if you've gone to college before and you come back for a weekend, more things pop out at you that are different. Has there anything that's just that's caught your eye since you've come back this way? Blue catfish. Blue catfish. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that's a big one. Um, No, I mean, it's honest. Maybe it's just because I I kind of keep my ear to the wall in Maryland because, you know, I've got family here and friends here who fish and, you know, I have a vested interest because I, I grew up here. So I'm concerned about our resources as well. So I, I'd, I'd always check in on it. Um, but nothing that stands out too much to me. If Honestly, not much has changed. I, I worked for Maryland DNR as an intern for three summers. Uh, and it's it's honestly weird. Uh, it was a little bit weird. I'm getting over it now. But but coming back and and working in Tall's because I used to work here for three years and a lot of the same faces are here. You know, I worked three cubicles down from where my dad worked for like 20 some years, crazy, which mm. is uh, which is a little bit weird at first. Uh, but we yeah, when I came back into the doors, it was it was funny. There was a lot of people who I would recognize them, but they wouldn't recognize me or they would recognize me and I wouldn't recognize them. 
Um, but it's been it's been great to be to be back here, uh, and it's it's very uh, yeah, it's very cool to come here and, and work here in this role, especially. Um, yeah, it's just you know to work for. I loved working for Arkansas, and I loved working for the people there, um, especially some of the trout anglers. You know, I really resonated with them. Um, but there's something to be said about working for you know where you grew up and the resources that you grew up fishing on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very humbling and cool. It's this area is so unique, especially with all the lines. I mean, even talking. I remember talking to your dad and also John Odenkirk. Um, just about you have the Potomac, you know, the Potomac Association, Potomac River Association, you have Virginia, you have Maryland, you have all these lines that you don't see, but they're on the map of whose responsibility it is. Uh, that's just got to be stressful, interesting, an interesting challenge. Any way you want to reword that just to get things moving here. And that's the thing that I've seen since I got in the Black Bass Advisory Board is you can be altruistic when you're on the sign lines on doing anything, when you're trying to make a difference, you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is how we got to go with it. Um, with the Potomac and all these prevailing interests and everything, how do you, I guess, I mean, the thing is that you've already kind of, you've been here. That's the thing is you've grown up here. And even if you don't do it, and this is something I know in the comment section will be there, you you live, if you grow up the son of a mechanic, even if you don't become one, you pick up on stuff vicariously. And I think that's something that gives you a huge leg up is even though you haven't been here the last couple like four or five years whatever you your home is here your family is here you you have picked up on some of these things you know where everything is going right now um besides the blue catfish water quality wise do you think i think this is probably the best our water has been in 10 to 20 years hands down even though bass fishermen complain all the freaking time about it just because they like to complain those are my words and i will stick with them um it's just, it's so unique to me, like with all these prevailing interests, and I'm going to get to my question here a long about way, <laughs> I promise. SAV, subaquatic vegetation. It's a big one that we talk about here in the wholesaling with, we're not talking about wholesaling in this episode, guys, that's its whole other Pandora's box, but it gets down to the grass, the SAV. Was SAV as important on the White River as it is in this place? Or is it basically equally, you need SAV on any river for it to be healthy? very 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 different systems um and we had a little bit of sav on the white um but you know one thing i'll point as point at is the little red river uh the little red river is another great trout fishery in arkansas it it held the world record at 1.40 pound brown trout good lord yeah big fish um and very different watershed than the white um and because of that, it has a lot of sediment input into the Little Red River. And so the submerged aquatic vegetation, fine sediments, I should say. Um, and so that fine sediment kind of settles into the Little Red River. It allows that SAV to grab hold. And then you see a compounding factor where the more SAV you get, that slows water down and then drops more fine sediments. More fine sediments allow for more SAVs. And we actually see what a lot of fishermen perceive on the Little Red River as too much submerged aquatic vegetation, where it's inhibiting um, their fishing ability uh, because they can't fish in there. Trout fishing, very different than bass fishing. Bass fishermen want to see the grass. They want to punch. They want to fish frogs on it. Um, Fly fishermen do not want to fish through (laughs) submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, and so they actually perceive it as a problem down there. Hmm. Um, whereas I'm sure almost everybody up here would say more grass, more grass, more grass. But also you're talking about a tailwater trout system versus a tidal, you know, a tidal yeah. system. Yeah. Uh, two very different systems. Um, yeah. So what is fine core? That, I, I've heard of sediment, especially uh, when we talk about with the Chesapeake Bay Association, like runoff from new developments and all that stuff. But what is fine core sediment compared to just uh, sediment I'm thinking about that runs off from a construction uh, site? Fine sediment's just like clay and silt. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just really, really small stuff. It's, you just can rub between your fingers. Hmm. Um, it's almost basically like, not I wouldn't say soil, but it's just like very, very fine sediments um, that these plants definitely need to hold on to. Like, think about it. If you have a bunch of boulders out there, probably you'll get some attachment with SAVs, but not as much if you have finer sediments where their roots can really grab hold. Mm. Um, So anytime you see like a big runoff event where you see that dirty water, 
that's a lot of fine sediments probably from erosion being introduced to the system. And when you have that SAV, that SAV slows down the water movement and those fine sediments drop out a lot faster, um, which is, you know, one of the one of the benefits of SAV um, in in certain systems where it could be used in other systems it's it's a detriment as it's perceived on the little red river in arkansas yeah that, that uh, culturally that's so fascinating when you and this i think helped you a lot by experiencing different parts of the country the culture towards the habitat and the different fishes because yeah you're right like the tidal fishery when it comes to sav whether it's you know the bait fish for the bay the blue crabs the like so many things depend on these these grass beds here just almost like down in in florida honestly yeah but then to think about that i didn't even know that about about trout that you know it might not be advantageous to that that environment that's fascinating yeah and trout huh. also they need a certain similar to paddlefish they need a certain substrate size to spawn on and so if that fine sediments covering that stuff off that stuff up it kind of limits where they can they can spawn um, so those fine sediments can be pretty pretty negative in, in trout fisheries. You're like the third biologist I've interviewed that talked about doing research for paddlefish. What is the hype around paddlefish research? Because it's just interesting that I know they exist, but a lot of fishermen, and maybe it's because we're not in the area for it, don't target them, but everyone researches them. Is it just because they're an endangered species? Like what, what, what is the deal with them? Yeah, they're a cool species. They're a member of the Acipenseriformes order, which lumps them in with sturgeon. Uh, they're... They're threatened in most most locations. They've been extirpated from a lot of a lot of places, and they're also technically a sport fish. So they fall into a bunch of the circles where where money can go. You know, hmm. endangered or threatened species, game fish, uh, and it's also not a very well studied species. So it's a really uh, it's a really good species in general for funding to go towards because you're not only tackling uh, conservation needs, but you're targeting recreational needs as well. Um, and in Oklahoma, specifically where I worked, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge deal. People love to fish for paddlefish in the really? spring. And it, I would, it, it, I've told people it'll never be like my thing. Like I'll never be like a paddlefish fisherman. Uh, but some of the most fun I've ever had with a rod in my hand uh, was fishing for paddlefish, How, which isn't super sporting, but it's fun. Yeah, because like they're they're not bait eaters, so to speak, because they're filter feeders, correct? Yeah, you've got to yeah. snag them. Yeah. How big do they get? Uh, the biggest one I've ever held was a little north of 100 pounds. Uh, actually, when I was doing my research in Oklahoma, they broke the state record three times and the world record once. And I think it was like 154 pounds. How long is that? They measure, so paddlefish for anyone who's listening who doesn't know what it is, it's a uh, it has a really long rostrum on the front um, and they don't include that in the measurement. They do eye to fork length hmm. and I don't know, probably 40 some inches would be my guess. Don't, That's qu a don't, hell quote, of a don't fish. quote me on Probably bigger than that, honestly, now that I'm thinking about yeah. it. But eye to fork length, probably something along those lines yeah. 40, 40, 50 inches, probably close to the world record. It's They're impressive beasts. That's insane. And guys, and for the people that are listening, just Google world record paddle tail. I mean, it'll, it'll pop up. You can do a little research on your own there. Um, yeah, that's fascinating because they are like basking sharks in that sense for people that have watched Shark Week this summer that they do. They just they, they go around and they filter feed, correct? Is that basically? Yeah, yeah. They're show? entirely filter feeders. Some of the smaller paddlefish and some diet work has shown like some small minnows in their stomachs. Hmm. But I think that's just like, that just happened. They were filter feeding and it showed up in their stomach. They're almost entirely, uh, you know, plank divorce. How much do, how much does the uh, Asian carp affect them? So there's some research out there. And that was one of the first questions they had is, you know, is Asian carp going to affect, uh, you know, paddlefish? Because uh, they both are filter feeders. And Asian carp select for a different size uh, phytoplankton than uh, paddlefish. So there's not a whole lot of overlap uh, and their dietary needs. Hmm. Yeah, because exactly that was my first thing. Just even it's just their biomass. I and mean, it's the thing with like the blue cats where you can just get so many of them in a system. Does that push everyone else out or, you know, like the lake trout with, with what happens there? That's that's really interesting, dude. Wow. I mean, I know we, we've covered so many things, just a, a huge, a huge branch. Thing, <laughs> we but that's probably why, overwhelmed but some people. No, yeah, bit. yeah, we probably did. But then again, guys, <laughs> if you have questions, just you know, you know, email me or just drop a, a comment in the comment section down below, and we can kind of get to it because we've gotten nerdy before with, with this kind of stuff here. The one thing, other thing I wanted to bring up was Riverkeeper Association. I've had a great relationship with them because of Shenandoah. Shenandoah was ground zero for a terrible toxic spill back in the early two thousands. That whole shtick. 
river keepers are very heavy in this area of the country uh the potomac river the susquehanna basin do, do, do you have a river keepers organization for the white river area or there's are you a, familiar with them there's a couple people that represent the interests of the anglers and the people that are out there but i don't think because my understanding is river keepers is like a kind of parent organization then they have different yeah. ones so i don't think there's uh i don't think there's an actual white river um river keepers um but there are a lot of very interested groups like trout unlimited mm. uh, friends of the norfolk river friends of so there's a lot of vested interests but i don't think there's a river keeper uh under that like that nested group that represents the white river or some of those rivers down there i bet trout unlimited is big out there too compared to here that's fascinating pretty big um yeah we that was one of the groups that i dealt with a lot when you mentioned uh, earlier, when you grew up here with the brook trout situation that they were native, is there is that going to be something that, how do you preserve that when you deal with all these droughts and these weather changes, whether, you know, for people at home, whether you believe it or not, like the, the change in the climate over time, is that something that we can deal with when you look at how well you guys have stocked the White River? Is there a way to preserve and bring back native trout waters in certain areas or, or will some of them just the water gets too warm and there's nothing you can do about it sometimes the water gets warm um and there's not much you can do about it but um there are in in that specific instance you know if the water gets too hot and you have a fish kill there's not much you can do about that but there's a lot of things you can do to preserve that and if you want to dive into that you know you can probably talk to matt lawrence more who's our yeah. cold water specialist um but it's a lot of it is just working with um with landowners um, and a lot of that's habitat restoration, um, getting cover, uh, getting trees in the riparian area to reduce the amount of sunlight that warms the, the streams. Hmm. Um, and then I think, and I don't want to speak for Matt, but no, no, I no. think he's doing, um, I think Matt and, and Jason Cessna, who are our trout guys, Jason's our, um, our brook trout guy and Matt's our cold water specialist. Um, and I think they're looking into some genetic genetics too to look at you know what strains belong where um, and maybe I think they're going to get going hopefully in the next two or three years using some of that genetic stuff to do some reintroductions into areas where they pro where they maybe have been extirpated because of an event like warming but they can go back in and be reestablished. Hmm. Um, so that would be some really cool and exciting stuff because brook trout really really are a gem here in Western Maryland. I'm going to have to make a note of that and get them on the show. That is fascinating, especially about the shade. That's such a simplistic, sort of speak, problem to solve that is just more shade will create. Yeah, I yeah. I never even thought of that. Wow. A healthy riparian huh. zone keeps those fine sediments out of the streams and out of the rivers, and it also shades the river, shades the stream, uh, and, you know, keeps that temperature down. Um, you know, it, it's a big help. I would say riparian areas are one of the most important things uh, for brook trout, besides connectivity, but... We, that's a whole nother ball game too. And I guess that wouldn't really affect, that's very much for a trout stream versus like a, a tidal basin, like, like the river. W what's the biggest headache there? Not headache is the wrong word, but what is the biggest thing to deal with when it comes and not the people aspect? Okay. Let's take that out of it. Cause we can always have our fractions, different tribe you have to uh, uh, talk to and communicate to, but just the system itself. What's the biggest curveball with dealing with a Potomac river versus a, a trout stream? is the Potomac River or it's a it's a it's uh you know an estro it's essentially a tidal stream tidal or tidal rivers are just they're so dynamic they're so dynamic in the how big the watershed is uh the environmental conditions year to year flood drought salinity mm -hmm. um SAV there are so many moving pieces um and we had a lot of moving pieces in Arkansas and the trout rivers but we had a lot of control over them we had a lot of control on how many fish we stocked, the size of fish, the regulations. In the Potomac River, a lot of it is out of your hands. You know, True. you're, you're yeah. dealt a lot of cards and you have to adjust and adapt to those. You know, how much SAV you have, how much tournament pressure you have, good water quality, drought, flood. You know, a lot of it's out of your hands, which makes managing some of these rivers really, really difficult. That is interesting. I've always wondered at what size is it no longer controllable? Because if you go from a farm pond that's had half an acre to a trout stream to uh, Kerr Reservoir on the North Carolina Virginia border to the tidal Potomac to the Chesapeake to the ocean, at some point it is too big for us to have a massive, massive control over it. And I remember this conversation came up when I had um, 
uh, uh, Sikorsky on about the striped bass issue and a comment section was like, why, why can't we just stock the, the Chesapeake? And, and it was like, that's like a drop of water literally in the ocean. Like you, it you can't, <laughs> there's not enough money to do something like that. And, and that is interesting going from a trout stream to the tidal system. I've always had this, this question that will never be answered, but like, is it getting so big that like, we have to understand like what we can do with a reasonable amount of financial responsibility to keep things going the way they are for everyone's a piece. And yeah, it is again, not really a question for you, but yeah, that is such a fascinating thing. Cause it is, it's so freaking massive. And when you talk about the Potomac, just being a small part of the Chesapeake and how important the Bay is to Maryland, it, it puts everything in perspective. Cause I feel like, you know, with a lot of anglers, when you're talking about like bass anglers, you get so much into your tribe about just the bass and then you don't think about the striped bass tribe the the the, the blue crab tribe it, it's so interesting but when you back out and look at this massive painting it's just one small cog in this machine it's it's fascinating it really is yeah and i don't think a system ever gets too big to be managed and have an impact on um i think the amount of information you need to make the right management decisions become so vast true that yeah. it there's a lot of unknowns in you know what management actions might affect certain things so i don't because you can always have an effect on a fishery oh yeah commercial 100%. fisheries and you can always you know institute regulations to shift the baseline but just the the amount of factors uh, that go into having making the correct choice becomes overwhelming yeah. almost. Yeah, and I just think that it's perpendicular that the bigger it gets, the harder it is oh, yeah. and the more resources it'll take. And I think that's something that people don't appreciate when they say, just do this. And it's like, if it was a pond, yeah, that's super easy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, when you start talking about the Chesapeake, that's a lot different than the pond. And then you yeah. have to understand like, like the fish stocking. The logistics to stock a million trout in a state is insane it's got to be astronomical okay then apply any decision you make to whatever you do the potomac will also will affect the chesapeake bay yeah and that has to be taken into account and it's just it's a very sobering thought in my opinion 100 percent. but i think we're we're on the right track especially with working with virginia and dc that new tagging uh project that started three years ago just communicating a little bit better and getting a more you know general understanding and, and talking to the other agencies more um, so I think we're, we're really on the right track with using the resources as widely, wisely as we can. So, and then just to really, just to tidy, to, to bring this back then to, you know, the Black Bass Organization, um, is, is there anything when you're dealing with these, with these groups and everything that you're, how do, how do I word this? Bringing in to just understand all the people that are involved, because I think it's such a passionate crowd that you're so used to um, in the trout world. And I think really Trout Unlimited and Bass, they're pretty much, the, they're different but the same when it comes to the group and their passion for it. Is, is that kind of true that Trout Unlimited and Bass, are, they're kind of the same when it comes to passion? And so it's really, it, it's different but the same for you. Oh, 100%. And uh, I have a really, you know, I'm a pretty avid trout fisherman and I'm just an avid fisherman in general, but I have... Going into that job, I had a great understanding of trout fishermen, and I have a decent understanding of bass fishermen, but I, not as well as I did trout going into that job. And so one of the main things that I really want to do in this first year that I'm here uh, is just get out and meet as many people as possible. I was down at the Virginia Elite Tournament um, at Smallwood last weekend. I've gone to a couple other tournaments, the PVA, MLF. I went to a Middle River um, Thursday night tournament. Um, and so I really would implore anybody who's listening to this, you know, um, reach out to me. I want to come out. I want to meet you guys. Uh, if you guys have any bass club meetings, any tournaments that I can, you know, help you guys trailer boats or mm. help the scales, you know, um, I think I can relate and understand anglers well, but I really in this next year want to get out and meet as many people as possible in this community, in the bass fishing community in Maryland, just so, um, you know, I can really finely tune just that understanding and really relate to these people and know that, you know, if we're making this decision or we're thinking about this research or we're thinking about whatever, that, you know, I have a, a, an idea of what the anglers are going to think that that represents them. Um, and so that's one of the main things I've really been pushing. Um, you know, I've only been in this role for a little over two months, but I really would like to make that push in the next year or so to get out and, and meet everyone that I can. 
Yeah, and then and then everyone, I'm going to have Ryan back on this show since he's just getting his feet wet here. We'll have a more in-depth conversation on specific issues with the Black Bass, Black Bass Advisory Board, and just Potomac once you know he gets acclimated and we really get some time under our belt to hit some of the things that are coming up. Um, but then, as always, like, I mean, Ryan, yeah, I really appreciate you coming in the show today. Uh, is there anything that we want to promote or uh, anything you want me to put in the link in the episode description? The Black Bass Conservation Fund. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then, yep, Joe, I thank you for reminding me um because i know joe's gonna kill me for that one so yes uh, link in the episode description to the black bass advisory fund um actually did you want to just do a little promo for that too actually by the way what what is the black bass advisory yeah fund? so the black bass conservation fund um is something that's new in the last year or so i believe and joe who was the previous title black bass manager put a lot of time and effort and so did a lot of other people like roger tregasar and scott sewell yep. um to getting that passed um, and essentially, it's a dedicated fund uh, for conservation of black bass uh, in Maryland. So if you donate to that fund, it will correlate directly with black bass management and black bass probably stocking um, yeah. and just conservation fund. So a lot of it's probably going to go to stocking or stocking related things. Um, but like a lot of other states, like a lot of other smaller states, we're limited in what we can do because of financial resources sometimes. Um, and so this is a way uh, for you guys to directly donate to the conservation fund that will go into conserving bass, putting more bass mm -hmm. in the river, putting more bass in the rivers they need to be in. Um, and so you can do that by going on to uh, just where you buy a Maryland fishing license. Um, if you haven't bought one for this year yet, you're about to go fishing. Uh, you can just tick the box. It's down at the bottom. Um, you can donate a dollar. You can donate as much as you want. Um, or if you already have your license, you can just log on to Maryland's Compass site. You can go in and just like buying a new tag or something like that, you can go down to the bottom uh, and donate however much you want. And that, again, will go directly to uh, Black Bass Conservation Funding for uh, stocking or stocking related activities. And then guys, link in the episode description just so you can click on that if you'd like to donate. I think we're a thousand dollars away from the biggest milestone to where we're going to be able to implement some stuff. Uh, uh, especially with the fish stocking program, we need to fix up the hatcheries. And this will be just for largemouth stocking and, and raising of largemouth. So again, link in the episode description for all that information. If you have any questions for me or, or for Ryan, comment down below or email me fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.